You ask questions. Here we have to ask ourselves questions. How do we allow all these polluting industries to become part of our ecosystem? How do we allow four private prisons to exist? I mean, what does that say about us as a people to allow folks to profit from locking people up? And then you have to ask the question, how do we allow ourselves to become a country where so much of our manufacturing base is weapons? So much profit in killing people. And it's not just weapons that are then used internally. It's weapons that we sell or give away all over the world to some of the worst countries in the world. I thought we had laws for that. <laughs> There's supposed to be something called the Leahy Law and these other laws you can't sell weapons to human rights abusers. Oh yeah? So, you know the number one purchaser of US weapons, right? Saudi Arabia. How did we allow that to happen? How do we get to that point? We shouldn't be allowed to sell a BB gun to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> I mean, Saudi Arabia should be a prior state. And you know what's happened, um, not because of the daily bombing of poor, innocent people in Yemen that the Saudis are doing, not because they blew up a school bus and killed 40 children, or they blew up wedding parties, or funerals, or marketplaces, or clinics, or hospitals but because one Washington Post reporter was killed, Jamal Khashoggi, that turned around a lot of people in Washington, in the Beltway. And it helped those of us, many of us in this room have been working to say, don't sell weapons to Saudi Arabia, they're causing the largest human catastrophe in the world right now in Yemen. It helped us get the support we needed to get votes in Congress in both the House and the Senate, which means you had to have some Republicans in there, <laughs> to say, no, don't sell those weapons anymore. And they didn't do it one time, they did it two times, they did it three times. Of course, every time it went to the desk of the orange man in the White House, or what is it, Ayanna Presley calls him the occupant, right? <laughs> the occupant in the White House, he used his veto power to veto that. But it is really just such a horrendous, stain on us as a people to have allowed ourselves to get to the point where weapons manufacturing is such a major part of our economy, where we sell these weapons to the worst international characters, or we give them, as in the case of Israel, give them $3.8 billion of our money given to basically our weapons makers to then go to Israel to kill Palestinians. How do we allow ourselves to get to that point? It's kind of like the frog, you know, and we, we just, you know, in the hot water, hot water, hot water, and suddenly we don't feel it. But we are at a point now, and I think that's what both of you were saying. We're at a point now where people are feeling it. And feeling it in so many different ways. I mean, just yesterday, it was really wonderful being um, with uh, 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 Jane Fonda in her Fire Drill Fridays. And if you haven't heard of what she's been doing, I mean, here's a 82-year-old famous actress who could be doing a lot of other things with her time. And she said, I have been so taken with what the young people are doing. And she mentioned Greta Thunberg, but she said so many other of the young people in the indigenous community and the black community, what they are doing to say to us as adults, hey, the house is on fire, do something. And so she moved to Washington, D.C., Fire Drill Fridays. And every Friday, every Thursday night, she does a teach-in. And because it's Jane Fonda, hundreds of thousands of people watch that teach-in. And the next day, she goes out and she does, uh, gets the, the, the experts in different issues related to the climate and women, the climate and water, and yesterday was the climate and militarism, and gets the experts to come and talk again, and then goes to jail. And, you know, a lot of us have gone to jail for justice. Nobody gives a damn. <laughs> Jane Fonda goes to jail. You hear about it, or, or, or you hear about it in places that many of us don't watch, you know, like The View. 
I don't know if you all even know what The View is. <laughs> it's a big TV show that women all over this country watch. And there Jane Fonda goes on The View. And what does she talk about? She talks about climate and she talks about the Pentagon. And she says, we're spending way too much money on the Pentagon. We should cut hundreds of billions of dollars and put that into the Green New Deal. I mean, we all say that, but to hear her saying it on places like The View, that is important. And so I give her tremendous kudos for doing this. And every more and more people are coming. And to uh, watch that march yesterday that went from the Capitol and hooked up with the DACA students who were fighting for their right to stay in this country where uh, they deserve to stay, and then to hook up with the people at the White House who are there banging their pots and pans to say, get that man the hell out of the White House. Um, it's a great coming together of issues. And it's just one example of the many examples that are happening these days where we see so many issues coming together. And one other issue that I wanted to mention that Jane Fonda brought up is that she was spending the night. She spent 20 hours in prison. And when she did, she came out in shock. And it wasn't so much in shock because she had to sleep on a metal slab in a cold cell and was given a bologna sandwich, it was in shock because everybody in that prison was black. And she said, you know, this is, is slavery, what's going on in there. And she's now talking about this as well, adding it to the connections that we have to make. So the connections are being made in so many different places. And I want to bring up the connections that we have to make with people who are rising up all over the world right now. But before I do that, I want to um, offer a $10 reward to any of you who could tell me who is this person who did this quote. And I just saw this as I was reading the newspaper in the Washington Post yesterday. So. It's an, uh, an op-ed in the Washington Post, and it says that this person who is making these remarks said, American capitalism has run aground, and we need a different role for business and the markets to keep us from drowning. This person asked this question, does our country exist to serve the interests of the market, or does the market exist to serve the interests of our people? And then the person writing this editorial says, Hmm, it's interesting. Both the left and the right are inching towards a consensus that capitalism is not working for Americans anymore. <laughs> okay, so who is the quote? Who did the quote? It was a politician. Who? No. No. A senator from Florida. Marco Rubio. <laughs> hey, I knew my ten dollars was safe because you'd never think of Marco Rubio. Marco Rubio is a very ambitious young man. She said Marco Rubio. Oh, I owe you the ten bucks. Okay, okay. <laughs> you know, he puts his finger up there to see which way the wind is blowing. And now his solutions are not going to be our solutions. But I thought it was so interesting to see that Marco Rubio is saying that capitalism or the markets have to work for the people. So what we don't see on our TV screens is what's happening in the world. You know, all we hear about is the Trump and Ukraine and Trump and Ukraine. And by the way, if we're going to impeach Trump, I would really like to impeach him for the illegal, Ill, uh, 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 inhumane, disgusting war that he's been waging in Yemen. Yeah. Or for pulling us out of the Paris Climate Accord, or for ripping up the, uh, the nuclear deal with Iran, and of course we could go on and on. But what is happening around the world is quite extraordinary, and our media doesn't let us see it. You might have remembered the Arab Spring, and we are now in the autumn of discontent. And it's happening all over the world, in the Arab world, in Iraq, the country that the US invaded and poured billions of dollars into. People are rising up and saying no to the government that is in power. And in places like Chile, that was the birthplace of neoliberalism, when the US overthrew the government Allende back in 73, brought the Chicago boys in to institute the brutal 
savage form of capitalism that they were forced to live under for these years, and now people are rising up and saying no to that. And you see people, yes, somebody said Ecuador, say Algeria, you can name so many different places, dozens of places around the world, Haiti, where people are rising up. And it's quite fantastic, it's quite inspiring. We don't know the outcome of many of these things because it could turn like the Arab Spring, you know, which led uh, to Egypt becoming under the horrendous rule of Sisi. But it could also turn to something incredibly positive. And we also have the very, very positive thing of Lula da Silva being released from jail yesterday. <laughs> to people all over Latin America and is going to reverberate in inspiring people to stand up. And so we look at ourselves at, at here at home and we see people rising up here and there. We see uh, you know, pieces of it, but we don't know when it's going to come together. We don't know where the tipping point is going to be. I mean, in Chile, who would have guessed that the thing that they rose up against was the rise in the price for the metro? And kids jumping over the stiles and saying, and then the government's going, oh no, oh no, maybe we should pull back and, and not do the increase. And they said, too late, <laughs> too late. Now it's not just the metro. Now it's everything. <laughs> it's all of you in power. We want you all gone. And that's what they're saying all over the world. We want you all gone. We want a different kind of rule. And we want not to have our countries based on extractive industries, but regenerative ones. We want our countries not based on competition, but cooperation. We are, want our countries not based on fighting each other. How are we going to learn to live together? That's what people around the world are demanding right now. And we are obviously not only part of that mix, we are so important to be in that mix. And we don't know when the tipping point will be. There are already people outside the White House every day now with pots and pans, banging on their pots and pans, because they don't believe that it's enough to let the Democratic Party try to impeach Donald Trump, that it has to be the people that rise up. And so I just want to end on a very positive note to say that we, that the, the tinder is there, that the sentiment is there. We have to just be there to keep rising up and providing people with places they can come with open arms to join us. And I want to end with a quote that I just discovered today when I was uh, in Connecticut right before here in a conference that was about converting from a dirty fossil fuel economy, converting from a war economy to a peace economy. And how are we going to get the workers to be part of that, especially the workers who are in these unions, and worry that they are the few workers that have good jobs. And you know, there's the machinist union. And the machinist union is one of the unions that has the best jobs in the United States. And when I've talked to people from the machinist union and said, we have campaigns to divest from the war machine, they just look at me like, thanks, sweetie, that's very nice, but you know, we got good jobs. We have 500,000 people that serve the Pentagon and are making a lot of money. So I discovered that back in the 80s, um, there was a big plan for conversion and that the unions were very much a part of that plan. And in fact, it was the president then of the machinist union who was part of this conversion plan. His name was William Whippensinger. Some of you might remember him. And this is um, one thing he said at a conference like ours that was talking about conversion. And he said, economic conversion permits us to pursue peace and prosperity and will bring us that much closer to ending our bondage to the warfare state. This is a head of a union whose members make weapons for the Pentagon. He said to end our bondage to the warfare state. He said we, meaning we the workers and we the people, are the hostages of this warfare state. And we the workers and we the people shall free ourselves from this bondage. So a, a, a positive note that there have been these kind of unionists before. They are there now, too, that we will free ourselves from this warfare state. Thank you.